Good morning, everyone. Hi. Yana, um, Jimna can't be here today, so I don't want to put you on the spot, but I didn't know if you wanted to call the meeting to order um, when we get closer to 10 o'clock or if you would like me to do that. Oh, you could do it. Okay. I know a few people let me know they might be coming late, but we'll give it just one more minute um, while I'm letting others in. Okay. Oh. Um, so Gemini can't be here today. And um, I asked Yana if she wanted to chair the meeting and do the um, call to order. She asked that I do it. So um, do I have a second? I can second. All right. Thank you. All right, and then we usually leave um, a few minutes at the beginning for public comment. So do we have any um, members of the public who would like to comment to the committee, the council today? I am not seeing any. Okay, um, I sent out the meeting minutes for approval. Um, is there any changes to the meeting minutes? All right, do I have a motion to approve minutes? Make a motion to approve them. Lois, and do I have a second? I'll second. Thank you, Julie. All right. 
right. Um, and I see Christine, you're on, and so is Jennifer. I don't know if either one of you want to go first for either waiver updates or Caroline updates. Caroline can go first. Okay. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for having me for our um, CTBHP Caroline Behavioral Health updates on Medicaid funded services. Let me share my, I'm not able to share my screen. I'll give you, hang on one second. You should be able to now. Okay. <clears throat> Here we go. Can everybody see the presentation mode? I can't see you, so just, yeah. Yep, you're all set. Yes, Looks good. All right, thank you. <laughs> Once I go into presentation mode, I can't see you anymore. So let <laughs> me know if there are questions, just pop up uh, rather than raising your hand since I can't see um, faces while I'm doing this. Okay, so our monthly update um, for um, data from August. There we go. So our August data that was pulled the, the beginning of September shows a continuous um, steady increase in all of our authorizations. Um, even our um, social groups, which is the lowest number of authorizations that we have, but it does continue to grow at a very slow, small rate. Um, you'll see here our treatment plan and program book development, the light blue line is our highest number of authorizations, as well as our behavior assessments. That's because that is available to members um, depending throughout their authorization period. So as an initial authorization, but then also um, throughout their treatment, if behaviors change um, or settings change or things like that, um, they have the ability to access another authorization to look at behaviors and how they're changing throughout the time of their treatment. <clears throat> We also have the diagnostic evaluation here. Um, and just keep in mind that this data is a, is a rolling three-year period. We can't um, show all of our data from 2015. Um, since inception, it's just too much to show on one screen. So this is rolling data for every three years. Um, so our diagnostic evaluation also continues at a, a high steady rate. Um, and in our next slide, we'll actually show um, current data. So as of September 2nd, we have 513 individuals authorized to receive a diagnostic evaluation. We typically see that number increase a little bit towards the beginning of a school year between now and kind of middle of October. We tend to see a, a pretty quick increase in the diagnostic evaluations as kids are getting back in school. Um, you know, educators eyes or, or social workers eyes are on those kids and they, they might have um, prompting parents to go get a diagnostic evaluation. We then have 4,808 kids accessing our service delivery. So that's either um, in-home services or center-based services, the individual service delivery for our, our members. Um, we're super excited that that number continues to grow. Um, and then we have 74 in our group treatment services. That number kind of fluctuates a little bit. It's it, not a whole lot. Um, it's not a highly utilized service for a whole variety of reasons. Um, but I think the kiddos who do need it are, are in those groups and um, really thriving in those group settings. On this slide, we look at um, individuals at age of admission. So admission is just their first um, authorization with autism services. Um, our three-year-olds continue to make up the highest number of individuals um, at 1,628 for all of our service classes. We love to see that. It means it's a good transition from birth to three services over to the Medicaid funded services. And we work very closely with the birth to three providers as they're transitioning those kiddos over to us. Um, and the behavior assessment and um, Diagnostic evaluation continue to also be our highest for um, service delivery. And again, that treatment plan and program book is always the highest number because it's, it's available to individuals more frequently. We then see a slow taper off as, as individuals get a little bit older um, for their first access to services. Um, they often continue in services, but this is their first access to services. So not as many older kids accessing for the first time. <clears throat> <clears throat> On 
On this slide, we look at our demographics for individuals accessing services. And just as a reminder, that unknown bucket is defined as individuals who do not identify their race or ethnicity at the time of their Medicaid application. That is a, um, a field that is not required. So individuals do have the ability to choose um, to not fill that in. So that gets uh, that gets bucketed for us as the unknown group. And that is continues to be our largest group at 33.5% of our members. Um, we then have Hispanic individuals at 27.1 accessing our services and then uh, 20.9 of white and 13% black and then 2.3% Asian. On this slide, we also demonstrate um, the, the percentage of individuals who are also involved in DCF services. So you'll see that we have um, almost 96% of our children are not involved in DCF, either um, committed or CPS. Um, there's only about 4.9% of individuals who are involved with DCF services, whether that's CPS or committed. And then a teeny tiny little 0.04% um, who also access the Carillon Voluntary Services. And while that is a teeny tiny percentage, those kiddos are quite complex, um, often have dual diagnosis, um, co-occurring mental health, sometimes also medical concerns. And those kids are, are quite intense in the amount of support that they're receiving from um, the ASD care coordination team, sometimes our providers, as well as our, our VCM team here at Carillon. Region four and five, um, DCF regions four and five continue to be our highest utilizers um, for the Medicaid authorized services. Um, th that's a little bit twofold. We have, while it's a higher densely populated area, we also have many more providers in those areas of the state. So it's easier for the ARC kiddos to access services in those areas. Um, region three continues to be our lowest number of authorizations. It's also where we have fewer individuals and only um, three or four providers in that area of the state. So access is also a challenge in that area of the state. <clears throat> Mm. On this slide here, we look at our provider enrollment. Very exciting that it continues to grow. Um, so right now we have 159 total agencies that make up our provider network. Of that, we have um, individual providers. We have 1,148 total individual providers. So that includes our providers who do any of the autism services, the um, diagnostic evaluation, as well as overseeing the service delivery. And then of that number, we have 1,017 who directly oversee the um, service delivery. So those are our BCBAs and licensed clinicians, our qualified healthcare providers. On the right, you'll see that our BCBA groups um, make up the highest um, group for our providers, which we expect to see as the, as the BCBAs are really the providers who are um, most experienced in overseeing these services. And then we also have an, a, a whole grouping of other um, agencies that are combined with BCBAs and then other licensed clinicians, all of whom are qualified through care lines. So the, the licensed clinicians are also qualified to work with these individuals. <clears throat> On this slide, we look at what the um, peer specialists and care coordinators are doing at care line, and they are a busy bunch of, of individuals. Um, on the right, we have a tiering system. So because we don't maintain a wait list at Carillon, every individual who has Medicaid and comes to us um, looking for some support is assigned a care coordinator or a peer specialist. So we tier our members based on the, the intensity of need that they have. So our, our tier two, that largest group of individuals at almost 80% of our workload are families that um, need a little bit of help in um, navigating the system, finding some providers. Um, we will help call providers for them um, to find out their referral process, what their wait list look like, do a little bit of the legwork prior to the family actually connecting with the, the provider. Um, that is the majority of the work that we're doing. Um, we also have our tier three families at 3%. Those are individuals who may have DCF or DDS involvement or may have some um, inpatient or emergency room visits. Our tier four families um, is the dark purple. I'm sorry, that says zero, it should be four. Um, 
And those are our families who are receiving the highest level of support through us um, through a wrap model of um, care coordination. And that ha that comes with a team of our um, our team lead as well as one of our regional care coordinators. Um, and that's reserved for individuals perhaps at the hospital for special care um, or who have um, significant discharge um, barriers when they're in either the emergency room or inpatient levels of care. Our tier one families are individuals who come to us and just say, hey, I don't know where to start. We're able to give them our website, some lists of providers, and they're like, okay, I'm good to go. Um, and I might call you if I have other questions. So we do get those calls as well. Um, and we just track that as well. <clears throat> Any questions? I did see some things in the chat. Um, I have a quick question. Um, so you said there's no wait times and that's no wait times for care coordination? Care coordination, okay. correct. So that's different from waiting for um, providers in the in the um, community, correct? Do you have an um, uh, idea of how long it is for wait times for evaluation and or the service implementation? Yeah, so we're actually in the process right now this year of building out a more um, accurate way to, to really pull that information. So right now it's based on provider report. Over the next calendar year, we're working to pull together that data on a more accurate basis through a data pull in our system. Right now for the diagnostic evaluation, if you're going to a small mom and pop agency, it's maybe, maybe a month and a half. Um, of course, if you speak Spanish or other languages, it's a little bit of a longer wait because we have fewer people who provide those. Um, for our families who prefer to go to our larger agencies, um, Yale, CCMC, Wheeler, who do fabulous evaluations as well, their wait lists are a little bit longer. Um, that's for the evaluation. For service delivery, it really depends on where you are in the state and if you have specific needs, right? So for our families who are um, speaking another language other than English, that we could be about a year, <clears throat> unfortunately. Um, otherwise, I think in a more densely provider populated areas, it's about six months, which is still very long. Um, we work closely if a child is DDS eligible or has BCM services, we work with those teams to see if we could put in other supports in the meantime. Sometimes we're reaching out to school systems to see if we can kind of beef up that child's day or, or you know, if they're um, eligible for extended day treatment um, or whatever, so that we can put those things in place while we work to uh, connect them to a provider. It is a long wait, I know. And I'm so excited that our provider network continues to grow, but those providers are extremely saturated. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then is there specific parts of the state that um, you mentioned that depends on where you are in the state? So I'm assuming that's our north corners. Um, and that is that accurate, though? I don't want to make the assumption. Yeah. So I would say... Um, that whole Rhode Island border is very difficult to connect individuals to providers. So while we do have fewer individuals, we also only have three providers in that whole corridor of the state. The other area that is challenging um, is the Litchfield area. So that Northwest corner. Um, and then just because it's so saturated with population of children, that Bridgeport Fairfield area is also um, can be challenging. While we have a lot of providers down there, they are completely at capacity. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Does anyone else have any questions on the data? And I will get out to this group. We're meeting with our providers um, in October to um, for our fourth forum um for this uh year so i'll get the information out to this group too so if you have people that would like to join um i have a question um we have a real crisis in connecticut right now in terms of providers um this has been building and building and we're really crisis um are there has anyone um made our a thought of of anything that could be done, made any suggestions? Is the state looking at this? Um, what's what's happening around this issue? And I know it's not just autism, um, it's across disabilities. 
but um, but we particularly have have always had a problem, and for us, it's it's even more. Um, anything? I can't see everybody on on the um, presentation, but if anybody from DSS is here or other state partners. I would prefer I, for them to I, answer first. I, so I can jump in. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, sorry. Okay, I'm Kathy Marcioni from ADS and speaking specifically to vocational providers, which I know is a very small subset of this issue. Um, I had reported at a previous meeting that BRS applied for a federal grant to start to try to address this issue in a more meaningful way. And we learned last week that we were not awarded the grant. Um, which was a big disappointment because it's a, it was a huge need uh, in mm -hmm. our state and nationally. Obviously, there was a lot of competition for the grant for that reason. Um, our director, Dave Dokas, however, uh, this is if I had to pick his top three issues, this is one of the three. So he's working with a number of other parties um, to try to see if there is any other way to get the supports in place we need to provide the kind of... Uh, changes we wanted to try to make to try to provide the kind of flow into the profession that we hoped to do under the grant. So while we didn't get the funds, uh, the, the issue is not dead in our agency. So I sent a query out to all of our providers to see about pairing with the state college system as a way to funnel staff to these providers to do either an internship program, a training program, or something to that effect. And to date, I haven't received any responses from our providers of interest, but I will send it out again to them. I Could I ask, I mean, I've been recommending for probably, I don't know, 15, 16 years. Um, <clears throat> that we look at the college, um, at the community college system, which is such a good one here in Connecticut, um, to offer some training, possibly a, de uh, a degree, um, a certification, something where we could be, we could be training people and getting people into the, uh, into the system. Is that one of the possibles that you're looking at? I have nothing off the table. If it's something that works, I have no problem moving forward with it. The okay. reason I chose to go with it now with the college system was when we removed the four-year degree requirement for some of our services, it opened us up to be able to take a lot of these college students that didn't yet have a four-year degree. Yeah. So once I get some response from some of our providers that they're interested in working with them, I will pursue it farther. Well, if I can just offer this up from a different conversation, I'm not sure. I think there are some people on here that were also a part of this conversation about um, the potential for offering a certificate program or right. something that was not non-degree, basically. Right. We have, at Southern, we have a relatively new office, but the woman who is heading this up is growing things by leaps and bounds. Um, it's the Office of Workforce and Lifelong Learning, and it's just the right sort of space for folks to be granted sort of micro-credentials or certificates that would, um, you know, allow us to kind of define what are the skills that someone needs, but then maybe kind of stamp them, brand them with this person has gone through a training program that you don't necessarily, you, we all know that there are folks um who have lots of degrees, but maybe not the skill. <laughs> and there are, you know, <laughs> folks who don't have any degrees, but certainly possess the skills to work very effectively. Um, so the question came up in this other group, and of course I'm forget, I think it was the subcommittee on um employment and yes. education. Thank yes. you. <laughs> it's coming back to me. Thank you. Um so uh, we were talking about this and I thought this was a really nice bridge between that. And I spoke with the woman from um, OWLS is our cute little acronym for that office, seeing as though we're Southern OWLS, um, Office of Workforce and Lifelong Learning. Um, and she thinks it's a spectacular idea. Someone had mentioned in that group, you know, it would be nice for some um, family members, you know, loved ones or whatever to go on to something like care.com and see that this person wasn't just well-intended, but they had 
receive some for, sort of certification, micro-credential, whatever it might end up being, that equip them with um, some strategies and skills. I think that's a really um, viable option that um, could gain some traction and wouldn't require people to devote themselves to, you know, you must have a four-year degree in order to affect change in this population, but it could gain some momentum and also make some real positive change with our folks. So I'm willing to continue to push that forward if people want to link arms and move in that direction. Yeah. Yeah, Lois, yeah. our committees actually um, met several times and had, I think, really very, very good participation and a lot of robust discussion. And one of the things that was sort of a um, inflection point for us was waiting to hear some of Jen's data so that because one of the, you know, the, the need is great across disciplines and different professions, right? So hearing about where is the greatest need um, and in what what areas of the state might help us focus a little bit because I think all things that we look at, um, the depth of need is so great that if we try to do everything, we're, you know, we can't boil the ocean. So we want to say, where can we get sort of a focused um, effort going and have some impact um, in a shorter term way? And so, you know, Jen, just to clarify, so what you're saying is the longest wait time are for the diagnostic evaluation, which required, no, I'm sorry. No, no, the, the longest wait time is for that initial behavior assessment to start services and then finding staffing. So our providers do the behavior assessment, find out the child's needs, what their behaviors really look like. And a lot of our providers then at that point go to hire staff so that it meets the, the specific needs of that child. That is typically the longest wait time. And if there's providers on here, if you want to speak up as well, um, but that's typically what we're seeing. That's the longest wait time is to actually start the services, the direct okay. treatment services. So those are in-home staff? In-home staff, correct. yep. And what's the current requirement for the in-home staff in terms of uh, credentials? The regulations right now are still for the um, uh, bachelor's degree. Okay. Or okay. at least an associate's degree and um, or coursework equivalent. Yeah. So, I mean, we talked about this on in our subcommittee and, and you know, as a organization with, that employs a lot of people, you know, working at that level. We actually started out requiring our staff on the autism unit to have a bachelor's. And we had to back away from that, frankly, um, because we just were not going to fill the need. On the other hand, I think just to reinforce Carrie's point that we've got some really phenomenal staff who have an associate's degree and a number of years experience either working, you know, at with somebody, you know, on uh, the autism spectrum, uh, either in a school setting or in a residential setting. And we really knock on wood, we are have been very successful in keeping those roles filled. The other thing we do, of course, is provide um, additional specialized training to them, because if you've worked in a school system, you're not going to be able to handle the acuity of our right. kids. But I think it speaks to really being flexible. And yeah, and I don't view it. I was very wed to it in the beginning and sort of dug my heels in to make this work. Yeah. And I just had to give it up and understand that we were trying to accomplish something that we wasn't going to be possible. Um, but I think we actually have not in any way diluted um, the quality of the folks that we have. I think we actually have folks here who are going on, you know, we are providing them an opportunity to work in the field and then they are going on and pursuing um, additional yeah. certifications. You know, some are becoming um, BCBAs. We're, we're, we're trying to support them in that effort. And I mean, I'm just one small piece of it, but I think I can say after a number of years, 10 years or so of this work that we have found that it is successful, but if it's, it's, we're not regulated to have them at a certain level. Right. So I think that speaks to maybe something we have to, as a group yeah. consider, is that something we want to advocate for um, because it means no service versus if yeah. we can't get the folks to do it, we're not going to get the kids to service. Yeah. So, so what I will say, and I don't see any of our other, um, Par our CTBHP partners on here, but just to share with everybody here that has been heard loud and clear um, by yeah. the partnership. 
Um, we've hosted several forums um, as a whole partnership. So Caroline and DSS and DCF, everybody has been part of these conversations to discuss these exact barriers. Um, and there's some really great brainstorming solutions being proposed right now. Um, so I'm hoping that there's some changes in the next calendar year. I'm, I'm, I'm very hopeful for that this year. Okay, so it sounds like there is work active work going on and we would be replicating um you know if we were to look at doing a committee um i well let me ask i i'm not on our involved educational training committee are you tackling that issue on that committee so we've only met i think twice right tara two or three two twice so the first one was sort of just forming the the you know what our what our goals of the committee were and now we're really just trying to refine the biggest area of need and focus but i'd say yes all of what we're discussing here right. would be carried forward into the the right. work and we've committed to meeting monthly and so far have met that goal right with good, with really good participation thanks to those who were able to join great thank you sure could, could i i just wanted to add something as a you know as a community provider um, I, you know, Lois, I see everything that, that you're saying, um, I'm getting calls every single day. I'm, I'm at now 50 hours a week, um, six days a week because I'm trying to meet needs because it's really hard to say no when families tell you, they call you and tell you that they've called 40 providers and they haven't, it's really hard to say no. And I'm trying to also, you know, make as much of an impact as I can through the, the eight groups that I run every week. So between the groups and individuals, I, I'm probably seeing like close to 100 people a week. And I also have had that thought in my mind. And I'm so happy to hear other people saying like, could we tap into the community colleges and and could we do something with a certification? I know I'm just like a one single person in private practice, but I would love to be a part of an initiative like that. I have no idea where or how it would begin, but it would be something I I just, I couldn't agree more that if we could train more folks, um, then we could have, you know, we could have more services available. So I, I appreciate that, Melissa. I, I'm particularly concerned about uh, folks who need community mentors um, because uh, I, we have calls, uh, we have unbelievable numbers of calls from families um, who, who just cannot find anyone. You know, I, I sit in a group um, with, uh, or I, I did with BRS, Bureau of Rehab Services, um, and often we make that recommendation to families, you know, that they, they do a private hire for their child, you know, coach in the community or whatever. They can't find them. I mean, they're, they're just not available. Uh, you know, we know what works. We know what people need, but they just can't find it. Uh, and this has been a continuing problem, and it's just escalated uh, dramatically over the last few years. Um, so I think the other big barrier, too, is that we're asking these people in particular to work kind of the crappiest hours right it's all evenings and weekends often weekends well not you all, know. but yes uh, often but not always no. yeah yeah i know that right. and that's a huge problem and if the work <laughs> is done properly those are the hours they should be done we want our folks to be working right you know, we want them to be working and uh and available <laughs> you know, only on the weekends or evenings. And um, it, it's just, you know, it's just a huge issue and we can no longer, you know, turn our backs on it, you know, or act like it's not happening. And that's how it feels. So uh, it's very frustrating for families. Yeah, if I can speak to that as an individual, it's incredibly frustrating. When I've been working on getting staff for a long, for a community mentor for a long time, but there's always constraints. A lot of them can't do the hours I need because I work during the week. And a lot of them, oh, I can, we can work with you, but we can do community hours at 10 o'clock in the morning on a Monday. And there's no community activities for people in their 20s, 30s, 40s on a Monday morning. 
what are we going to do? Go to the senior center and play canasta with yes. the grandparents? And that doesn't work for me. And I need to, and we've been trying to find somebody who can do those evening and weekends and be able to go to those social events because I want to be meeting people in the community my age and they don't do social events for people my age on a weekday. And I'm sorry if that's what works for them, but this, these hours are about me, not about what the staff's needs are. Yep, it's a huge problem. Okay, any more questions for, and so Lois, I think that um, if you, uh, I forwarded the invite to the subcommittee to all of the, the entire council. So if that is something that people want to join, um, Len, our next meeting for that is next week, the 25th at three o'clock. So um, if you don't have that invite and you would like to participate, please reach out to me and I will make sure you get that. It is also posted at our website. One Any, of the things we've been, sorry, Tara, no, one of the things we've been trying to do um, in the first couple of meetings is just really identify what training educational programs are there, like create sort of a repository, because I think not all of us know everything that exists. So sometimes while we don't want to duplicate efforts, we do want to replicate them, right? And be able to, um, you know, have them maybe expand. So, you know, p if folks, that's one of the things we're, we're identifying as we have those conversations and then say, based on the need, how do we leverage either existing programs or try to create new ones? So just something to think about if, in advance of the next meeting. Any additional questions for Jennifer? Okay, thanks so much as always. Um, yes. And if you could please send me the copy of your slides so I can attach them to the meeting minutes, I would appreciate yes. that. And then you said you were gonna send the um, October uh, forum information as well. Okay. Yes, I'll send that out to you and you can distribute it um, to the council and anybody else you think would like to join. Thanks very much, Jennifer. Um, so next we have ASD waiver updates. Christine, you had some updates for that. Yes. Hi, uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Weston. For those of you that don't know me, Director of uh, Community Options at the Department of Social Services, which um, includes the autism uh, waiver services. So um, don't have as fancy of a Carillon presentation, so I feel a little showed up. I, maybe I should have gone first because I, I certainly can't follow that, um, but we could work on probably making some visuals and dashboards for you in the future. Um, I have sent all of this information over to Tara for her to put into the notes. So uh, if I'm about to see some numbers um, about our waiver details, they'll be in the notes. Um, just high level with the department right now, um, we do have a vacancy at the managerial level for the autism waiver. Um, the posting is open to the public and it doesn't close until uh, the 20th. Um, that manager will have additional responsibilities. It is an HCBS waiver manager, but the autism waiver will fall under that as well as the case managers. So um, maybe by our first meeting of 2025, this council will meet that uh, the new hire, hopefully. We also have two care manager vacancies. So you may see some of your individuals might have moved into caseload under Mike. So Mike Olson is our supervisor, but is now carrying an active caseload during our um ramp up because as we're authorized to offer more people, um, our case manager caseloads are unfortunately growing, um, especially as we've lost two staff in the unit. So um, those vacancies haven't posted yet, but they will be posted um, for us to be able to fill to meet the need of the increased um, offerings under the waiver. So more to come on that. Um, they have not posted yet. I don't have like, you know, the chain of command approval yet for to post those, but those will hopefully be coming. Additional details on the waiver. So this summer um, during our, uh, as you all know, the autism waiver was expanded and there was incremental expansion each year. So we are now at a total availability of 440 slots that were um, additional, were released over the summer. 
And we have over the next year to fill those slots and ramp up um, off the wait list. We currently have um, 236 individuals that are assigned a case manager and are active on services. So those are uh, implemented care plans, not without some of the barriers that you all were just discussing, but are active waiver participants in, uh, you know, on the books. There's an, a whole host of other individuals that are in this um, bucket of um, onboarding. They either are working through the disability determination. They're working through the Medicaid application. Um, they're even contemplating if they want to go through that process, right? Some people are reached on the wait list and, and turn it down. Um, there's individuals that are found not eligible when they're reached on the wait list. There's conversations back to DDS about, you know, maybe is there a better package of services that are available for this person. So there's also a whole bunch of people that are just in this like flux that have had touches by the department but are not considered active on the waiver. Um, and that takes a lot of time and a lot of churn, And um, but we are trying to work through that. We still have our waitlist count is at 2,170. Um, we are doing some waitlist analytics. Um, we are working very closely with um, Krista over at DDS and working with their eligibility team to kind of assess our wait list and determine appropriateness. We, we feel like we can't continue, you know, since I've stepped into this position, we can't continue to have people just sit for years and not actually know if they're, if it's even appropriate for them to be waiting to a point where they may then not even be able to access the services. So we are trying to do our due diligence. We're trying to come up with a new methodology. We're working very closely with Tara and others um, on an interagency collaboration to really make sure we're serving everybody and that we're not making some unintended gaps um, or making people wait for something that they're not technically going to be eligible for. So there is some waitlist activity, um, again, taking time, but we do hope that we'll have a better handle on our, on our numbers and the need um, in the coming months. So in general, we're just continuing to onboard. We're contacting, it's kind of a first come first serve. So, you know, we, we start with the top of the list. We do send out a letter in advance that Mike and his team developed to prepare people for what it means to be reached. So some of these individuals might've applied eight, 10 years ago and they're like, oh my gosh, what does this mean? So, you know, we walk through what it means to apply for Medicaid, what it means to have to have a disability determination, what a five-year look back looks like, those sort of things. Um, so all of that is just our effort to kind of let you know where we are. We are ticking through to the 440. Um, we are very cognizant of people that have been waiting a very long time for services and want to be able to serve them appropriately. Um, and that's where we are. So um, Mike and I are here if you guys have any questions specific to the waiver or want to ask me anything about that update. All right. Well, thank you. Oh, quick question. Is all the paperwork for families and individuals, is it written in easy to understand words and terms? I know that we, and with the state, I used to work with the state, so I kind of familiar with. We use a lot of do we use a lot of jargon and yes. somebody that's an individual looking at this paperwork. Yeah. Like, so what is this? Can we write it in English? <laughs> yeah. So there was at, there was actually a very large effort department wide, so not just specific to the autism services, but department wide to work in more what we call plain language, plain language uh, forms. Um, very clear and concise details on, on what you have to answer, what section needs to be completed. So there are forms overhauls that are being done. So I, I don't believe, though, that the waiver application has had that overhaul yet. So that is likely not yet in a point where we would say that is in a kind of a best practice of plain language forms. Um, but our care managers are there that they can help kind of talk through the forms and there are opportunities for people to reach out with questions. But I, I don't believe our, um, what they call the W1LTC. <laughs> I don't believe that that, that long-term care application has been updated yet. Um, but it, it, all of our forms are under review at the department. We've heard that complaint from many, so. The application can be difficult for families and individuals to never, sorry. I'm just trying to read the chat, Tara. Uh, I think it, something popped up. Yeah. There's just reinforcing that oh, yeah. managers will go out and assist. Yes, there you go. Yep. 
All right. Thank you, Christine. Any other questions on the autism waiver information? Okay. Thank you so much. Appreciate your time. Um, so now we have a subcommittee report out. So Len, I know that we kind of already did that in some ways, but do you have anything else you would like to add on the subcommittee for training and education? Um, I, I don't think so. I, I think for us, I think the key is going to be consistently meeting because it's so difficult. If you meet quarterly, you, you start over um, with, you know, all that goes on. Um, but no, unless somebody else on the committee um, wants to share something that you know, I forgot in the in the overview. I'm sorry, I don't have my notes, specific notes from that meeting, but I think we talked about the general concept we're working on. Yep, we did for sure. Yeah. I think Anyone? the only other thing I would say is that um, in terms of placement for individuals, you know, looking for training, I mean, it really, we certainly do a lot of that from whether, it, you know, it is, you um, you know, we started with nurses' aides, and and I know that that's not um, particularly relevant to this population, but we did talk about is there a need to do a uh, you know registered behavior tech training program, for example, like we did. We started our own academy for nurses' aides. We fund it fully. The the, the individuals who are trained pay nothing for the program. It's um, our initiative um, to do our own work and building our own workforce. Um, and we, you know, goes all the way up to APRNs, PhDs, the whole thing. I mean, I think it does require that commitment in order to, uh, you know, there aren't a lot of places. Um, I mean, there are, but it, for us, the people that we're trying to hire, we're the only place in the state that does this level of work. So we have to be willing to commit our resources to do training if we want to build that pipeline. So. I, I agree with you. Uh, Lynn, I think that's been the problem in lot with a lot of provider agencies that they just have not, are not, you know, training their folks. And, um, you know, we see that repeatedly. So in the quality of the work, I just had to say that. Okay, I know the housing committee wasn't able to meet in the interim, um, but do you guys have any additional updates or anything that you wanted to report out on? Um, yeah, I we <clears throat> it wasn't that we weren't able to. We, um, you know, myself and Stephen Byers had decided as co-chairs that um, until we get a full report or a final report, I guess, um, on what's happening with the pilot, the housing pilot. Um, we really don't want to, you know, we don't want to take people's time up because that really is the area that we would like to focus on this year. Uh, we really need housing, uh, you know, and I have to tell everyone on this call. Um, and um, and we, <clears throat> we, you know, had decided that this is the area we wanted to um, focus on. And it's my understanding, maybe you can clarify, Tara, that um, that the pilot is not dead. No. Nope. A matter of finding the the um, the right provider, correct? Correct. To uh, to handle this, and uh, and it's my understanding. I don't think Judy is on this call right now. Is she, she couldn't attend today. Okay. Um, it's my understanding that, um, that that hasn't been done yet. No, okay. there's still some funding available for that. Um, this it's more procedure and process, um, and to identify a potential provider, um, the, what the funding that is available is pretty small, um, so whereas the supporting housing model, like at Demas, for example, is very successful, but they also have it scaled to the point that um, it's easier for them to operate that um, compared to, you know, asking a provider with a small amount of money and a small amount of um, 
you know, housing vouchers to, to start something up is, is a little more challenging, which is why we've hit some roadblocks um, in the implementation and getting, you know, that out. So that is something that we're still actively working on. And hopefully I will have an update soon on potential progress for that. Yeah, I'm hoping, you know, it's been a long time, you know, for such a small, pro even such a small project. When you look at the numbers of people in this state with this diagnosis and the fact that there isn't anything uh, available at this point, and we have families who are aging um, every day, um, it's it's really you know we're we're in another crisis. I hate to keep, I hate to be that person that keeps you know screaming crisis, but we really are when it comes to autism. So hopefully, so that's where we're at. We're waiting. We really don't want to waste people's time. We know okay. it's you know they they all have a lot to do. So hopefully, we will be meeting shortly. Thank you. Great. Uh, Yana, you have your hand raised. Yeah, in terms of the housing, I agree with Lois that we are reaching crisis. As me individually, I'm my parents are getting older. I live on my own, but I have nobody outside of them. I don't have any living siblings or close family that could support me. So I'm going to be, when the day comes, I'm going to be completely on my own. And it's really scary to think about. And I would love to be and have more support where I live so that it's a little bit less scary to think about the future. Because right now, the way I see it, I live on my own and God forbid something happens to my parents. I have absolutely nobody. I have an aunt and uncle, but they they live only they live in our town only part time. And then mm -hmm. I have no living siblings. So I don't I don't have that luxury of having a big family to support me. And I know I'm not the only one. And we need, we, def we definitely need more supports. And maybe we don't need a provider, maybe natural supports. Somebody drives, so that person that drives could take everyone to the grocery store. Somebody else has this train, so they can help everybody with this thing. We don't need to, we can get more creative. Or we could do, the idea that I had is, and it's been done before, is to have a mixed community and have our individuals assigned to another family in the building and it can be like extra family members who could support and be a natural support, check in with one another, join that family for dinner or go to the grocery store with them. And it could be a natural support. So there are other options besides waiting around for a provider. And we do have in West Hartford, the Camelot, it's a new apartment building that they're working on where the West Hartford Inn is. I'm hoping to get an apartment there myself, but that building would be ideal for our individuals, a lot of whom don't drive. And this is would be a great neighborhood right on the bus line, right near all the community services, pharmacy, library, Blueback Square. That's ideal. We need good, supportive community, good, supportive, transit oriented housing for our people. We need it now because parents are getting older. We have people who are living at home and it's not going to be pretty. Our people in the shelter system, it's a scary thought. Right I now, agree. That's the only option. I agree. Okay. Anything else on housing? Okay, thank you. Um, so as far as new business and um, discussions for the council today, I just um, wanted to put out uh, 2025 meeting dates so um, that I can send out an invite to everyone, but it would be January 15th, March 19th, June 18th, September 17th, and November 19th. So if anyone sees any issues that I missed with those dates, um, please let me know, but I will put those in the meeting minutes so that you guys can start planning for 2025 and also send out um, calendar invites, you know, at some point in time as we get closer. 
Um, I'm just then, looking at the high holy days. Just make sure we don't run into them next yeah, year. Thank you. I'd appreciate and that. We look good. Yeah, it, it looks good for next year. Okay, good. Thank you. Because it's the third Wednesday of those months um, that we meet typically. So I know that I think we're meeting on June 18th. That was close to June 19th, but or the Juneteenth date. So that was the only one that I identified was close. But um, if there's any issues, everyone can let me know. And then also, so the next thing is that the legislative session is going to begin in January. Um, so Jim and I wanted me to talk to you guys about um, potential priorities that the council may have as we're coming into that legislative session. And then, you know, if there was any interest in an ad hoc work group that would look at um you know, just bills and things that may be of interest to the council that they could meet a little more frequently and provide updates on what's happening in the session that may impact people with autism or services. And then if there was also any um, speakers or any presentations or anything, you know, that you wanted to talk to any of the legislators that we should look to organize. Um, so just wanted to kind of put that out there for conversation. Um, I think putting a, um, a Zoom call uh, possibly together uh, to meet with uh, legislators might be a good idea to try to figure out how to do that. I think that we really need to, we, we have a lot of new legislators um, that are not as familiar as, as some with the issues around autism in Connecticut. And I think it would be great to educate them um, about what we don't have and what, and how far behind a lot of other states we are, because we are. Uh, and, um, I, you know, I'd like to see that happen. I think that's something that this, this committee should be doing. Yeah, I would agree. I think a zoom meeting, you know, we get together with them on autism day, but that's, you know, uh, fanfare, if you will, uh, important to do. Um, but I, I think that since Kathy Abercrombie has, you know, unfortunately, not for unfortunately, good for her to retire. But as you know, I think that presence and that real that connection um, to the real work and the issues. I mean, they, they need to hear from us. You know what's working and what's not right. And and I think a Zoom is something convenient for them, and we can structure it in a way that is um, worth their time. And I think even trying to do it before a session. I know I find a lot of in my advocacy work here is that trying to get to them before things get rolling, you have a little more of their attention. They're, they're so, um, you know, they're so overwhelmed with detail. Once the session begins, I think we can help maybe set the priorities earlier on. It's a good so is that something that you guys would like me to try um, to put on the November agenda or are we open to a separate um you know, because we could organize around our November meeting to have a time to do that. I mean, I think it'd be great if it could coincide, but if not, I think it's, I mean, I'm certainly uh, willing to commit time to doing that. Yeah, I would, I would be too. <clears throat> Tara, are there um, specific agenda items that may be coming forward from the different state agencies that would coincide that we could be aware of as a council so that we're uh, not, I don't want to use the word competing, but that doesn't sound right, um, that we can be supporting and understanding so that we can be um, sounding like a unified front. So that's, that's kind of why I was Absolutely. Um, yeah. looking at, you know, creating, you know, and maybe an ad hoc, because we, if we meet, if we look at the dates for next year, session starts January 8th, we meet January 15th, and then again in March, but then 
our next meeting is in June. So we're, if we only stick to our larger council meetings, then we're kind of, we're not going to, you're not going to catch a lot of the, you know, potential bills or legislative proposals that may be coming out. So um, I do ask every state agency um, for each one of our meetings, I send out an email and ask if there's any updates or anything related to autism that um, they need to report out on. So that is something that I do for every meeting um, that you I give every state agency that's part of the council opportunity to speak. Um, a lot of that is being worked on now. A lot of the state agencies, um, you know, that information is kind of due coming up here in the fall and later this fall, like more October. So I don't know anything yet, like what, you know, any of those legislative proposals will look like. Um, but that is coming up, which is why I was recommending if, but I do think that there would need to be some kind of ad hoc committee or some people who are willing to take on watching, you know, the bills and what's coming through, um, because, you know, and, and maybe reporting out to the larger council. Um, otherwise we can get updates, you know it would go from January to March. So there may be some things, not everybody has time to watch all the sessions and hear the conversations and the discussions. Um, but if there was, you know, a group of people that wanted to work on that, um, it's kind of what I was proposing just during session, kind of as an ad hoc. Uh, yeah, I, I think, think there's really two things. I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Lynn. <laughs> I think there's only um, two, I think there's two different things. One is for, I think the council as a group to talk about what do we see as our legislative priorities? Because personally, um, if I can speak candidly, we can't go in and ask for everything. We'll, it just is not an effective strategy. We have to go in and decide collectively what is it that we want to see accomplished this year, right? We know there's more need than we're going to get. Um, resources for, and that's the reality. But we, I think if we go in with everything is wrong, we're not making any progress, we're behind other states, I think it just is like, yeah, 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 that's what they hear. I've done it myself <laughs> as, as, you know, going in and saying, listen, I'm 85% Medicaid, you know, this isn't working, and they, they tune you out, I think. And I understand that. I think we have to go in and be focused and you know, acknowledge that these are our priorities, and we need your help in helping us, you know, get closer to our goals in those areas. So I think that's something we have to. It's not my priority. It's whatever you know. It's the collective council. That's one piece of it. And then I think having a group to sort of navigate the session and all the information coming at us is a separate is a separate thing. Um, I'm happy to be on that group. I obviously am very. Um, closely connected to the information coming out because it's so much a part of what we do that I get a lot of that information, um, you know, through other avenues that I'm, I'm happy to share as it relates to, you know, our collective success in trying to move things along. But I do think we just have to focus and it's hard because we all have personal experience that are our own priorities. And then I think as a council, what we have to do, I think our, our role as council members is is um, not only to represent our personal situations, but also to represent collectively the autism community and what do we want to see accomplished from this council and you know have our members of the council drive that. Um, I, I think we'll be more successful. I, those of you who've been on the council a long time know that we used to have more of a legislative agenda. And I think that was a more effective approach for us. Just my thought. Yeah, I, I would agree, Lynn. Um, uh, the only thing mm -hmm. I agree with is, uh, and, you know, I, I certainly know what you're you're saying when you're talking about going in and sort of dumping, you know, right. it that, that absolutely doesn't work. But I do think that uh, legisl the legislators, and particularly new ones, need to understand that we, and, and I don't think it has to be dumped. I think it's a matter of educating yeah. um, that we are far behind and we are um, most of our surrounding, you know, states uh, when it comes to this diagnosis in terms of services, um, because I don't think people realize that. I think that they, 
they see that we have a waiver program and therefore, you know, blah, 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 blah. I, I don't think they look into the numbers that are covered or any of the specifics, uh, the details. So I think there has to be some education, you know, and I think it has to be done in that way, you yeah. know, education um, around what our particular situation is in, in uh, Connecticut. Um, I think data would be great, Lois. I think if we could quantify um, and, you know, sort of synthesize it, because we live this every day, both many of us, both personally and professionally. So it's so front of mind for us. And I think what we have to understand is this is one of, you know, 35, yeah. you know, diverse topics that they're trying to get up to speed on. So I think we have to, if we drive it with data, you know, and tell stories at the same time, because that helps the data makes more sense, come alive to them. But I think we have to have data. When we say we're behind other states, what does that mean, right? Yeah. Can we gather some of that and show that, you know, Massachusetts does this or whatever? I don't have that information um, easily uh, available, but I think that that would be time well spent on our part is to try to pull some of that data together so that they can walk away with, you know, I've been taught sort of this one pager that they can take with them and remember instead with all the other things um, that they're going to hear over the coming weeks. But yeah, I agree. I agree, Lynn. I think that's would be the best way of doing it. OK, thank and, you. Well, I'd be glad to um, work on a committee that, you know, um, that was dealing with the legislature. But I do think we should be doing a Zoom. So um, if I can, I can try to organize something for November, but what would be, um, I'm just thinking of the best way to kind of gather, you know, as a whole, some priorities. And again, I, you know, it's hard to get everybody together. So I'm trying to think through, you know, what are some ways that we can gather some information and come up with, um, you know, how we want to present this, if I can get legislators to attend in November. Um, so would people be open to providing thoughts in a survey if I were to put something together and kind of collect that data and send it out to the group um, that way? And then that way I can say, these are the, you know, based on what everybody said, these are some top priorities. And then maybe we can organize certain people from the council to present on some of that if we can get legislators here for November. Does that sound I like that. A reasonable plan. Okay. Um, I think Kim, did you have anything else you wanted to add because you were speaking first and then I'll go to the who has the hand raised. Uh, Lynn said it beautifully. Uh, I agree that we what uh, the only thing I would add to what Lynn said would be to, and I saw that Brian put something in the chat to that effect. I think it would helpful if we could gather what the other state agencies are doing so that we can either say we already know this is being addressed or we did not see this being addressed and we feel that it's a priority. So adding that point in would be very, very helpful. And uh, yes, I agree that pulling together a small group of us who are willing to do the work behind the scenes is critical. Um, Yana, did you have something you wanted to add? I think also we have to, a common misconception that is that, oh, your folks, are, they don't have an ID, they're so high functioning. Okay? That's how come I think we get a, a lot of the time. We don't get the funding that we need because oh, if you have a college degree. You can't be autistic. Well, but you live on your own. And it's something that we have to really break down that stereotype because like I might have a college degree and live on my own, but basic life skills and things that I struggle with and social skills are some I struggle with. I can understand historical comp historical information, history, and very complex things. It's the basic stuff that I struggle with, but we always, people think, oh, you're so high functioning. No, I'm not. And I don't like functioning labels. And if someone seems like they're very good at masking or trying to be neurotypical, that's because of years and years of training and, mas and also masking, which is super uncomfortable, which I don't like doing. I don't think we should be asking anybody else to do that. 
but it's just something to think about because I do get that a lot. Like, oh, but you're so high functioning. You can't be autistic. Yeah, newsflash, we can. And by the way, Albert Einstein, who nowadays people would have thought he was on the spectrum, he was a brilliant physicist, but he couldn't tie his own shoes. Autism's not linear, right, Yana? It's a, a spectrum. And I really don't like functioning labels. Mm -hmm. We're going to do mild, like somebody said, mild autism, sweet and spicy autism. <laughs> We're people, <laughs> not salsa. <laughs> Thank you. Carol, did you have something else you wanted to add? I was just going to say, I know we started talking a little bit about um, what other states are offering, and I, I think it might be worthwhile to look at specifically what other states are offering. I know um, Massachusetts offers, their, their autism program is very, very different than Connecticut's. Um, there isn't a waiting list. Um, and, but I can tell you probably why, um, and it's not all bad. Um, I'd live in Massachusetts, but I would be, you know, if, if people were interested in having a subcommittee to look at what other local states are offering, I would be very willing to be on that committee to kind of gather that information. That's all. I think we will need, um, depending on what we, if I send out a survey to gather that information as far as what legislative priorities may be, I do think we're going to have to have some um, smaller work groups and committees to get together to organize some of that information so that we can have a uniform presentation to legislators if um, that's how we decide to move forward. So I appreciate all the participation. Uh, if anyone has any ideas, you know, for the cert, otherwise I'll probably just leave it open-ended um, just to gather all that information first and then may do a follow-up to see who's interested um, or I'll maybe put that in there too, just to see if there's interest for people participating um, in the beginning. But if anyone has any feedback or things they would like to see in that survey, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Okay. Um, and Brian, I don't know if he's still on the line or if he had to jump off, but it looks like he put his update in the chat um, that CSDE is engaged in work to update the worksheet for determination of eligibility for special education services under the classification of autism. Um, over the course of the next couple of weeks, they will be collecting feedback and input to inform the draft revision. And he will provide an update to the council on a regular basis on that work. So I just wanted you all to have that update. I didn't have any other state agency updates besides um, mine for OPM. Um, that we are still working on. I still have just a few more outstanding membership appointments from the um, legislators. So um, still waiting to hear back from a few of those, but we did just hear back from um, Speaker Ritter that he will be appointing Melissa Paul Perez to the council as um, an advocate. And she will be joining us at our next meeting uh, to introduce herself and to start participating. Um, and if um, there's anyone residing or anyone that you know who's residing in the Hartford area um, that is a person with autism who would like to join the council, please let me know because he is also looking for um, somebody to fill that role. So you guys can reach out um, to me on that. And that is all I had. So if anyone has any other new business they wanted to bring up or any other um, updates or comments. You have one, Yana? Go ahead. I just wanted to share about a new, it's not a new program, but it's a really great resource for our individuals. It's called the Museums for All program. So those of, if you have an individual with an EBT card, which is the state of Connecticut, Silver Connect card, they can get tickets to 
museum for all museums for only three dollars and you'd be able to visit i could put the link to the website up but it's a great program the museum that i work for the mark twain house we participate in it so yeah we take the card you can you can get tickets and see the mark twain house for only three dollars i know mystic aquarium is another one that participates in this program so if you have somebody that wants to go to a museum, that wants to get out in the community, this is a great program if they have that silver EBT card. Great. Thank you. If you want to send the or pop that link in the chat, um, I can add that to the meeting minutes. I just added the link and there's a list of museums that participate. If you go under Connecticut, you could see all the local museums that, part that participate in the program. It's a really great program. So I encourage you to have individuals with that Silver Connect card, food stamp or the DSS card. All I think all of our individuals on the waiver have the Silver e the EBT card. They can participate in the museums for all. Okay, thank you so much. Appreciate that. Any other updates, Lois? I thought I saw your hand raised. Did you? Uh, uh, well, I just wanted to know uh, for those of us who have not gotten the um, go ahead um, uh, renewal, I guess to the uh, to the council. Where, what? Where are we at? So um, I have. I'm still waiting on Senator Looney to get back to me for the two appointments that he has. Um, uh, Speaker Ritter still has one um, appointment and Senator Harding has one appointment that I have not heard back on. Everybody that's current members were sent as um, you know, who are previous members were sent out as um, recommendations for them so that they can continue to serve. But I have no control or <laughs> any, I, I am just doing all of the legwork to reach out and try to navigate that and get, um, you know, responses. So So hoping to have a final list um, before 2025, that would be my <laughs> my goal since I've been working on this since I started in this position. So, yep. Yeah. Um, okay, if there is not anything else, can I get a motion to adjourn? Motion. Thank you, Kim. And a second. Second. Thank you so much. All right. Well, you guys will get a little bit of your time left um, today. So thank you for participating. And we'll see you guys in November. Thank you.